Well, good morning, church family. It's about that time, ain't it? Well, welcome to God's house. It's so good to see your smiling faces this morning. We got a big treat for you. Mr. Jody's going to preach for us this morning. Looking forward to hearing that. Um, let's get up and do a little hide and neighbor. Howdy, neighbor, howdy, won't you come on in? We'll fix a pot of gravy to sop your biscuits in. And we'll take that banjo off the wall, let the music start. We'll sing them good old gospel songs, make them feel small. Oh, come on in, sit right down. Have a cup of coffee and we'll Come on in, sit right down. We'll put some yee-haw in your day. Come on in, sit right down, have a cup of coffee and we'll pray. Come on in, sit right down, we'll put some yee-haw in your day. We'll put some yee-haw in your day. Oh, God, children sing. Oh. We want to thank you for uh, giving us this house to, uh, of yours to, to be able to worship in. I ask that uh, today you be with Jody as he brings the word. Uh, guide him and direct him. He's going to be uh, giving you his word through Jody. So be with him while he does that. All these things we ask in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Building below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Driving along, places we come. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Where could I go? 
Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? I God's own word When my soul needs money from above Where could I go but to the Lord Yeah, where could I go Where could I go Seeking a refuge for my soul Needing a friend to help me in the end Where could I go but to the Lord? Yeah, where could I go but to the Lord? everybody. I have your upcoming events. Uh, I think first Bob would like to speak.
Thank you, Bob. Okay, we are looking for team members. We need an um, audit team leader, a benevolence team leader, a prayer team leader, and we need somebody to head out our backpack program. So if any of these you're interested in, please see Will or Mickey or Bob and talk to them about heading those teams out. Okay, we have uh, Wednesday at 6.45 p.m., the youth meet. 7 p.m., we have Wednesday night service. Saturday, August the 12th at 11 a.m., that's next Saturday. We're going to have the women's meeting here at church. We're going to uh, have testimonials and uh, part of the time and try to get to know everybody the rest of the time. So, ladies, uh, just bring some finger foods for our lunch and... Uh, Come and join us. Saturday, August the 19th, we are having a float in the Denton County Fair Parade. So if you would like to ride on the float, you need to be at the Denton, the old Denton High School on, I can't think of the street, Fulton, thank you, on Fulton by 830. And then we'll all finish up what needs to be finished up and load and it's a great time y'all I've rode it the last few years and yes it's hot but it's worth it and also if you could I we need candy to throw uh, for the kids and stuff so anything you can help us with would be appreciated Saturday August the 26th at 10 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry 9 a.m. we are having a play day then at 6 p.m., we have the Back to School Bash. David Brown's brother, Philip, will be here painting as he brings the message. We're going to be having hot dogs and hamburgers will be served. Let's not forget our backpack program. Anything you can bring and put in the box out there in the hall is appreciated. It just helps those kids who don't have any snacks or eats during the summertime. And then it'll continue through school time. It just helps. Did I forget anybody? Anything? Thank you, Bob. Miss Shelley is the person who cleans our church. She usually does it on Friday. Well, she can't handle it by herself. So we need people to volunteer to help her, to come up and help her clean the church. Uh, it doesn't take that long if we have a couple, three people. Also, September the 9th, Please mark that date down because we are going to be doing a clean the church day. We're going to mop and clean and dust and pick up things that don't need to be out and just kind of make the church look nice and pretty. Uh, be here at 8.30 in the morning and Miss Shelley will be telling us what to do. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Bob, for that because I had forgotten. Okay. Okay, she says it can be any day to clean. Just if you have a free Tuesday, call her, and she'll be up here to help you or get it going. Anything else? Okay. You guys know what time it is. It's time to hug necks, shake hands, and say howdy. Howdy, Miss Wanda.
I am going to a city where the streets are golden lay where the tree of life is blooming where the roses nail here they bloom but for a season soon their beauty is decay I
where the roses never fade. A woman in the Bible days, her last meal almost gone. But God sent Elijah to make his word known. He said, woman, don't worry, for God sent me today. And before you even asked him, help was on the way. Hold on a little longer, help is on the way. A brighter day is coming for those who believe and pray. Help won't help tomorrow if you give up today. Just hold on a little longer. Help is on the way Troubles of this life come by And burdens get you down You think no one is listening You think no one's around Just remember what his word says Trust him and obey Keep your eyes toward the heavens Cause help is on the way Just hold on a little longer Help is on the way A brighter day is coming For those who believe and pray Help won't help tomorrow if you give up today. Just hold on a little longer. Help is on the way. Just hold on a little longer. Help is on the way. A brighter day is coming. For those who believe and pray Help won't help tomorrow If you give up today Just hold on a little longer Help is on the way No, help won't help tomorrow If you give up today just hold on a little longer, help is on the way. what this is anybody a rope or a belt anybody it's a bridle what does it go on horses. horses very good and what does it do for a horse what does it help do lead what else ride it giddy up there you go control it it helps control the horse. So why does a horse need controlling? That's right. If it doesn't know which way to go, you can control it. Very good. So how do, how, how, what controls you? <laughs> Who's in control? 
your nana, okay? <laughs> your mommy or your daddy? How about God? Is God in control? Yes. And temptation, very good. You know what? You nailed my verse. Because my verse is about control. That's right. That's right. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And self-control is a fruit of the spirit that's also mentioned in Galatians 5.22 and 23. It is the ability to control our thoughts, emotions, and actions. Right? So that's what we need. Horses, sometimes you can't always control. That's why you got that. Because, like, if you're running down the fence, or like the other day, my horse's head stall just came off and fell. And so I had to get him stopped with no bridle. That was kind of scary. I had to get God in control then. <laughs> I had to do a lot of praying. <laughs> uh huh. Get through a gate? Yeah, we do. That's cool. Oh, man. So we need to be in control. God gives us control, but we have to trust in God to get that control. We are responsible for our actions. Nobody else, just us. So we have to make sure that we're making the right choices in our life. And that's where God comes in and your parents or your grandparents, whoever is controlling you for right now until you're old enough to control yourself. But you always want to make good choices, right? All right. Who wants to pray us out? Come on up. You? Come on. Good job. Here you go. I found one with a ring. And I wanted to go to Tata Bell and go to... Sonic and I want to go to Taco Bell too. Amen. Amen. Good job. Somebody wants to go to Taco Bell and Sonic. All right, y'all can go with Miss Dina. Wait at the back. Thank y'all for your input. It's our time for praises and prayers. We want to know what's going on in your life that uh, we can praise God for. We should thank him daily for the things that are happening, and especially the things we take for granted. And then uh, we want to know what's going on in your life that we can pray for as a church family. So, yeah, Mickey. Denise is back. Denise is back. That is a praise. We're so happy you're here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Thank you for your words. Yeah. We're happy you're here. We're so happy. Yeah. Cindy. <laughs> I don't know if anybody is the same, but maybe I got released from the hospital. We had to stay in Houston, and they have to, you know, yeah. go back and forth for about a month. Yeah. But let's keep praying that baby gets strong. Yeah, that's Bubba's nephew, right? Yeah, I, he uh, got released, so he's got to stick around and be close just in case so they can watch him. But, yeah, so that's a praise that he got out of the hospital. Okay. Yeah, Loretta. Like you said, he went back in the hospital yesterday with pneumonia. Okay, so pray for Red. He went back in the hospital with pneumonia yesterday. So he's a old member of our church that uh, moved to, out to Amarillo area. 
So we miss him a lot. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Natalie Snyder's family, she lost her sister on Friday. So let's pray for that family for peace and comfort. Okay. Yeah, Bill. Kathy Johnson. Okay. So pray for Kathy. She's kind of going backwards with some little bit of bad news, so pray for them. Yeah, Ken. Yeah, Ron. Yep, so yeah, pray for Ron, that's Squeaky's husband. Um, so we wanna pray for him as he's in the hospital. They're running some tests to see. Right now it doesn't look, according to Jody, it doesn't look like a heart issue, but uh, we're gonna, they're gonna try to figure it out, right? Yeah, okay, so that's a good thing, yeah. Okay, Shishu. Okay. Okay, Kathy Anderson is uh, doing chemo, going through a little rough patch, so it seems like it always zaps everybody. But uh, let's pray for her as she goes through that. Okay? All right, unspoken prayer. All right, would you pray with me? So, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the day. We're so grateful for the opportunity to be here in the house that you provided us, Lord. This is your house. You're just... You're just allowing us to visit here each and every time we show up, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for life. We thank you that we have the ability to be a part of your family, and and Lord, that uh, <coughs> excuse me, you uh, you provide us grace and mercy each and every day, Father. Uh, you love us. You show it to us each and every day, and a lot of times we take the things that you do with us for granted, and Father, we just. We just come before you and just pray that you would forgive us, not only for that, but for our failures when we don't glorify you the way we should. And Father, we just pray for Jody right now. We lift him up, we put him in your hands, and we just pray that the words that are spoken will be your words. And that as he speaks to us, our minds and our hearts and our souls uh, would be open, that we would hear it, we would accept it, but most importantly, we would use it in our lives and share it with others, Father. And we just pray for the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with others. And Father, for the things that were mentioned today, those prayer requests, we just put them in your hands and we just pray for peace and comfort and uh, your loving arms to surround each and every one of the individuals that were mentioned and their families. And Father, for all the blessings that you give us, Father, again, we praise you and thank you. We ask that as we leave this place, you would keep us safe. Bring us back to hear your word again. And everyone said, Amen. Yes, well, I'm glad you didn't ask me what that was for, because if you don't put gasoline or diesel in it, I don't ride it. I know some of you have looked over here at the board, and there's a chapter in 1 Corinthians, we're not going to go over, there's 58 verses in it, we're not going to go over each and every one of them, because uh, I know y'all want to hurry up and get to Miguelitos and beat the other churches, so I won't cover every one of them. If you would, go with me in prayer. Lord, to come to you again today, thanking you for this day that you've given us and for the opportunity we have to be in your house, Lord, and I pray that uh, as I bring this message that... Um, It'll be what uh, you would have us to hear, and that uh, if anybody here um, is moved to, that, uh, that they'll come to know you, Lord. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I titled this The Greatest Sermon. Can you hear me? Can you give me a little more mic? Huh? Uh, um. It's probably one of the, it's classified as the 1 Corinthians 15 is the greatest and most important chapter of the Bible. If you were to select 10 chapters out of the Bible, uh, you'll find 1 Corinthians 15 would be on that list and probably been on a lot of lists for times in the past from other 
uh, speakers. This chapter speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our own resurrection. That's the glory of the Christian faith, that it never views life as ending in death. The Christian faith always looks beyond the sunset to the sunrise. It's another factor that means it gives meaning to the purpose of life. I expect to live in eternity, and I think you do too. I'm not in a hurry to get there. I don't want to be on the next bus because I want to stay here as long as I can because I think this is the proven ground. This is a place of preparation. Rewards are determined here. What we do here determines our rewards in heaven. And I need some more time to get a little more good marks on my side of the ledger. I feel that um, a lot of times in the Christian faith, we've lost the sight of ascension. We leave in our minds the incidentals. It adds up to a lot of tragedies in many Christians' lives. I firmly believe that if we as Christians truly believe the good news about Christ, we could change the world. So I want to offer up to you what I believe is the greatest Christian sermon ever preached on the earth. Now I'm not referring to the sermons of our Lord or the words of our Lord. Other than the words of our Lord Jesus, I believe the most would agree that the greatest Christian preacher, sorry Ken, is St. Paul. I also believe that the height of St. Paul's recorded words is the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. In my opinion, this is the greatest Christian statement ever made. Verse 1, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you also stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. What Paul is saying to us is I bring you good news. You know, a preacher can stand up here every Sunday or any pulpit, and he can tell the truth and never preach the gospel. I can stand up here and say cancer is bad. That's the truth. Cancer is bad. But it isn't good news. But if I say, here's a medicine that can prevent cancer or cure cancer, that's good news. And that's the gospel. I can also stand up here and I can say, we have sinned. Every Sunday I could stand up and talk about the sins that we have all done. And in my case, it would be a long list. And every word I said would be the truth. But not one word of it would be the gospel. I could also stand up here and talk about how bad things are in the world. And that again would be the truth. But again, not one word of it is the gospel. What Paul is saying is I bring you good news. I firmly believe that if somehow we could get over to the world that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news and get over to every preacher, preacher in America that his business is to preach the good news, the churches. Would be, wouldn't be big enough to hold the people because we all like to hear good news. Now, in this sermon, Paul tells us what the gospel is. He has an introduction. He brings three points and a conclusion. I don't personally know what seminary or university Paul went to. When I was in college and we had some college writing days, that's what they taught us, three points and a conclusion. The first point he makes is that it's good news that Christ died for our sins. That's what the Christian gospel is. We say a preacher ought to preach the gospel. What is it he ought to preach? The first point is right here in the third verse of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Christ died for our sins. It's right there in the third verse. For I delivered to you as first importance that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's the first point of the Christian gospel. That's where it begins. If it doesn't begin here, it doesn't begin anywhere. If you take the cross, 
Out of the Christian faith, you've got no Christian faith. All you have is Christ died. There are three things I want to talk about on this. To begin with, Christ believed in something. He believed in it enough to die for it. I don't know about you, but I can personally sit here and say, you know, I love all of you, but I'm not going to have my daughter crucified to save you. I'm not going to do it. And that's where I fail, you know. So you're, you're lucky. You, you're going to be all safe. But God did that for us. And I think if everybody searched their soul and thought about it themselves, they wouldn't sacrifice their kid either. I know a lot of people don't feel that the Christian faith is worth much. They don't feel it's very important. So how important is a Christian gospel? Well, I did a little kind of a search on Google if every person in the churches in America today were on Social Security, and if they all tithed, we'd have a lot more money for the Lord than we have now. You can go to any church in America. I don't care what denomination. And if everybody in that congregation was on Social Security and tithed, that church would have more money than they do now. We don't believe it. We spend more money on beauty products and beauty parlors I don't spend any on it. I probably should. We spend more money on that in the United States than we spend on the work of the Lord put together. We spend more money on alcohol in the United States than we spend on the total program of the Christian faith. There are a lot of people who don't think it's really important. Do you know anybody who truly, really ever sacrifices for the Lord? Jesus thought it was so important that he died for it. Everywhere you look these days, it seems people are trying to get the perfect body. You see magazine covers, internet pop-up ads. Uh, I think sometimes we talk and Google hears us and it shows up on our feed. They feature tips on how to lose 20 pounds in 10 days. Cosmetic companies promise creams that erase the time on your face and the media continues to bombard us with the idea that we should all look like runway models. Can you imagine me as a runway model? A middle-aged, bald, fat guy, that'd be a fright. But we don't have to turn to surgeons or to the latest diet fad to get the body we've always wanted. In fact, as Christians, God has promised us that ultimately we will end up with a perfect body. If you're a Christian, one day, you'll have the perfect body. It's fascinating to me as I observe things how quickly we abandon that which we can know with certainty in search of things we certainly cannot know. This curiosity is resident in all of our human nature. It's not bad. It's what spurs us to invention and discovery. Adam and Eve had the whole of the Garden of Eden to explore and enjoy. But where did they end up? In the one place that was off limits to them. The second thing as we look at this is that there's a revelation of God's love. There was a fellow named Leslie Weatherhead. He once spoke of a time when he was a youth. He was sailing across the ocean. They determined it was actually the Mediterranean Sea. And he was on a ship. I was sitting on the deck of the ship. It was so dark, I couldn't see my hand before me. Suddenly, a volcano began to erupt. Light began to come, fire out of the mountain. It seemed like the whole world was lit up. Then it died died down and was dark again. For a few moments, I realized the fire that is constantly burning in the heart of that mountain. Now, if you look at the cost, somehow we are deeply impressed. This is where John 3.16 is. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. What is God's attitude toward us? His attitude toward me and toward you is he would die for us. He would die for us. The third thing that happened that day, and I don't necessarily know exactly what it is. It goes beyond human understanding or at least my small brain. And you can't explain everything that you you find in the Bible. 
Sometimes we just have to accept on faith. But the day that Jesus died, we sing a song. What can wash away our sins? And then we answer our own question. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, I can't explain it. I can only accept it as faith. But that is the first point of the Christian gospel. Christ died for our sins. Now, the second point is right here in the fourth verse. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the second point of the Christian gospel. You remember the night. He was in Gethsemane. The soldiers came. You remember the betrayal of Judas? You remember those trials before Herod? You remember how that he was in a dungeon? I've seen pictures that came up on Google again of a dungeon that is believed to where Jesus was, where he was held. It looks like a small, dreary place. This is where Jesus spent his last night. See, in those days, when they convicted you, they carried out the execution fairly quickly. You didn't get to spend 20, 30 years on death row and have 14 appeals to the United States Supreme Court. They handled it quickly then days. They got him out, they marched him to the cross, and then they nailed him up to die. <coughs> Excuse me. The point Paul is making is that when we die, what we will be buried will be our natural bodies. Those bodies are meant to house the soul. When we are raised up, it won't be our natural bodies, but our supernatural bodies. Bodies meant to house the eternal spirit. I think a lot of times we camouflage death. We don't want to face death. We don't want to admit to its reality. We don't like to use the word. I've heard of, mar of couples going to marriage counselors or pastors before they go to, to perform their vows, and they want to change the line of till death do us part. They don't want to use the word death. We use special words. We use say somebody has passed on. I don't know what that really means. I mean, I do. They passed on to, to greater things, uh, and with the Lord I, I pray. But I'm here to tell you, death's real. I heard somebody on TV the other day saying that somebody expired. They were talking about death. I guess they expired like a gallon of milk. I don't know. I don't know exactly what that means, but I think I had just soon die as expire. We need to realize that death is real. One of these days, I'm going to die, and one of these days, you're going to die. Jesus died. He was dead. That, and that's all we need to know about that. They put him in the tomb. They sealed it with a large stone. They put a guard of Roman soldiers around. Man did his work. And then God took over. The earth began to shake, and those soldiers became as dead men. An angel came and rolled the stone, and life came into the tomb. And Jesus came walking out into the world. The gospel doesn't tell us something we must do. The gospel tells us what Jesus Christ has already done for us. We've all had occasion to go to the cemetery and visit the resting place of a friend or loved one. Well, I can stand here today, and if we all could travel to Jerusalem and ask, where is Jesus buried? If we weren't laughed out of the city, I can tell you Jesus Christ is not buried in Jerusalem or anywhere else on this planet. He's alive. Again, with Google, there's two places over there. They're tombs. One will say this is where Jesus was buried. Another will say this is where Jesus was buried. I don't know which one it is. But if you look at it and you look at the pictures of them, they're both empty. That's the second point. We sing, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Now, the third part of the Christian gospel is first Christ died, Second, he lived. The third part is you're going to live. We're going to live. You're going to not end up in a little ditch in the middle of a cemetery. Just like Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we be raised. And that is in verse 6 and 7. After he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, then he appeared to James and all the apostles. If you read down to verse 9, it says, 
where Paul stays humble in his sermon. He says, For I am the least of these apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And I think that's where we fail a lot of times uh, because we think that because we have sinned so bad that we can't turn back to God. No matter how far we've gotten astray, we can all return to Christ like Paul did. And that's shown in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more. Now let's skip down to the 55th verse. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And then the 57th. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the third point of the Christian gospel. You're going to live. I'm going to live. Death has lost its sting because we are to look way out beyond death. It's a doorway that opens up. It opens up to vast regions of eternity. It starts us down the hallway, the hallway not of time but of eternity. The world is not the end of the story. We sit around a lot of times and we wonder why things happen. Why do we have death? Why do we have suffering? Why do we have these tragedies in life? There's a lot of questions to answer that I don't know. We're all like Paul. Now we see through a dark glass, but when we're face to face with Jesus, all the mysteries will be taken away. There is hope. And Christians understand this, Revelations 21 and 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow or crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. I want to tell you today, you're going to live forever. That's the Christian gospel right there. I mean, somebody can say, what is the Christian gospel? That's what Paul is saying Christ died, Christ lived, you're going to live. That's the Christian gospel. But that's not the end of it. What are we going to do about it? You can stand up and talk about death and resurrection of Christ all you like. That isn't going to do you any good unless you're going to do something about it. It's got to cause something to happen. We come to the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15. And I think this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. It's the conclusion. Paul says, therefore, Paul was referring to everything that he said before. We have a lot of resolutions in churches today. We have whereas this or whereas that. You don't pay attention to it until you get to the therefore. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's saying that if you believe in the gospel, you'll be loyal to it with your life. We all become frustrated at times. We want to quit. I'm just going to give it up. We get worried things don't go like we think they ought to. We get discouraged. We ask ourselves, what's the use? Why am I going through all this? Why am I doing all this work? After all, I don't see any results. Serving the Lord can become very much a routine. While there are times that we see the impact of our ministry and the difference we make, those are few and far between. The majority of the time we're left wondering if we really make a difference. Part of this feeling, I think, is from our sinful infatuation with ourselves, thinking that somehow we are to make a difference, and part of it is limited ability to remember that it's not us doing the work, but Christ doing his work through us. The su success of any ministry of any kind is not based on results that we can see, but rather upon our faithfulness to our call and our ability to leave the results to God. St. Paul says if you believe in a Christ who died and lived and you're going to live, you're going to be loyal with your life. There's no reason why any of us should quit. I sometimes sit back and think about this church. I think about the members of North Texas Trinity. 
I don't know the exact number of members. I can guess. I sit back and think, you know, well, some of us are wealthy, some of us are poor, some of us are educated, some of us are not educated. It's a country church. We have represented here just like the world does. Some of our members may be in the state penitentiary. If the truth's told, some of the rest of us probably should be there. But you know, I think about the members of this church and what would happen if the members of this church decided to be loyal to the church. We could change Denton County. We must remain steadfast. We can't afford to sit back and allow the work of the kingdom to go undone. It is said between 93 and 95% of the people do not go to church. And you don't need statistics to tell you that. Just look as you go home this afternoon. We were coming here today and there was kids already on the ball fields at uh, Evers Park. They, the people that don't come to church, they're going about their weekends and their lives with absolutely no thought whatsoever to God. Not only do they not recognize their need for God, but they think we are foolish and weak for holding to our faith. We're going to face opposition, persecution, and maybe even death. It's going to be hard in this life. But we live in the confidence of what we can experience for ourselves today. We live in confidence of a life to come. A confidence in the resurrection where we will be raised up to an eternity with Jesus Christ forever. It's not built on speculation, but on what God has already done. Just as Christ was raised, so also all of us who believe in him will be raised up with him for salvation. It's one thing to be confident about something you speculate about. We do it all the time. Everybody's an expert on anything, and we're all expert on things that we really don't know a whole lot about. We all do it. It's something else completely to die and go to your grave. You better be confident when that day comes. I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It was in Latin, and I don't understand Latin a whole lot, but I got an English translation, and it said, I think, therefore I am an atheist. We got a lot of work cut out for us. Jesus is coming again, and given the way the world's moving, it could be soon. What will we do when we stand before him to give an account of our work? What will we say when he asks us if we did everything we could do to reach more people for him and his kingdom? If we believe in Christ who died, I'll tell you there isn't anything we wouldn't do for him. We are loyal to him with our lives. Someday, it could be today, Jesus will return. The dead will be raised, and that which is corruptible will be made incorruptible. We'll be given the body we've always wanted, but we don't have to wait on Jesus, or we don't have to wait till Jesus comes, I'm sorry, to be the body we're supposed to be. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for this message that you've given me, Lord, and, and if it touched somebody's heart, thank you for that, Lord. Uh, uh, as we go throughout our week, the remainder of the week, Lord, I pray that we continue to to think of you, Lord, and, and to share the good news that you have brought to us, Lord. And as we go our separate ways, I pray that we have a safe trip home and, and bring us back safely on, on the next service, Lord. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good job, boss man. Yes, that four years of college did pay off, didn't it? <laughs> Good job, thank you. All right, well, I hope y'all have a safe week. And be good and stay out of the heat too much. It's going to get hot this week. Because he lives, well, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life.
less than safe week.